Democrats and Republicans in the Senate will vote tomorrow on whether to allow more witnesses to testify in the impeachment trial. Four Republican senators will need to vote with Democrats for the motion to pass. Several Republicans have indicated that they may do so, and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell appears less than confident that he can keep his party in line. On today's show, I interviewed House impeachment managers Hakeem Jeffries and Val Demings about their experiences with the trial. I'm Jamal Simmons. Here's why you should care. Congresswoman, I want to start with you here. Um, what is that like walking onto that Senate floor on the first day uh, and facing that body in this very historic moment? Well, you know, for me, it is, uh, of course, it's a historical moment. Uh, when I think about my own background, to have the ability, number one, to uh, be elected to the House of Representatives and serve the American people, especially those in my district, in such a special way, you know, we could stop there. But to have been chosen as an impeachment manager and to go onto the historic floor of the Senate every day, uh, where only uh, two women of color, two black women have served as members of the Senate, and three have, have argued her case or spoken on that floor, and now I'm the fourth. To be in that space at such a critical time, yes, arguing the case on behalf of the House of Representatives, but also arguing the case on behalf of the American people, because what we are fighting for is so important. So it's just an unbelievable feeling. It's not easy at all. There's a lot of hard work and emotion that goes into it, but I've taken my oath very seriously and I'm fighting the good fight. You're a former law enforcement officer. Uh, how does that experience uh, impact your judgment when you come at a case like this? Well, I, you know, I, I took my first oath at age 26 as a young law enforcement officer that I would protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We took an oath to the Constitution. We've taken an oath to the Constitution here. And as a law enforcement officer who started out patrolling on midnight shift, I've seen the effects of good government and good leaders and what they can bring to a community in terms of uplifting every neighborhood. And I've seen the effects of bad government and bad leaders and how they can tear down and destroy. And so to have this, I am clear on what I'm fighting for, to have enforced the law and seen the good and the bad, I'm very clear on why I'm here in the House of Representatives and very clear on what I'm fighting for because of the experience, the good and the bad, dealing with real people with real issues who are working more than one job and struggling just to make ends meet. Anyone who threatens our republic, anyone who threatens our democracy, I took an oath to hold them accountable. Congressman Jefferson, I'm going to pivot over to you now because uh, you're an experienced litigator, you're Democratic House caucus chair. Um, who are you thinking about when you're making your case? Uh, is there, do you have a particular, not just the people in the room, but the people outside the room, who are you really talking to on that floor? Well, it's been an honor uh, and a great privilege to work alongside Val and Adam and all of the impeachment managers uh, for such a time as this in terms of our objective really of defending our democracy uh, and fighting for the American people, fighting for the notion that in this country no one is above the law. That includes the President of the United States and in our view he must be held accountable for uh, his corrupt abuse of power. And so in that regard, uh, in many ways as I mentioned on the floor last week, we're fighting for the idea of America, the notion in America of separate and co-equal branches of government, the notion of the preeminence of the rule of law, uh, the notion of one person, one vote, that the American people should decide an American election. Not the Ukrainians, not the Russians, not the Chinese, the American people. Uh, and so in many ways, I think what we're fighting for is the precious idea of America that has endured year after year, decade after decade, century after century, as we just continue our long, necessary, and majestic march toward a more perfect union. You know, I heard yesterday uh, on the floor from the White House counsels 
them saying basically the president does it in the first term of the of the of his administration it's legal and it has to be if the president does it it's legal um, intent seems to be at the heart of the argument you guys are making there are actions that that America's seen presidents take before you may not have liked but they didn't get impeached for them. Is intent part of the case that you guys, is that really what I'm hearing, that that's a big chunk of the case you guys are making? Well, we've laid out a clear case that the president has acted with corrupt intent when he pressured a foreign government, Ukraine, to target an American citizen, Joe Biden, solely for his personal and political gain, not to advance any American foreign policy interests. He tried to cheat in the 2020 election. He got caught and then he worked hard to cover it up. That's corrupt. And in the United States of America, he should be held accountable for that behavior. It's extraordinary that effectively what we've heard from defense counsel is that the president should be allowed to get away with almost anything, and it doesn't matter. That President Trump should be allowed to get away with corruptly abusing his power. President Trump should be allowed to get away with trying to cheat. President Trump should be allowed to get away with covering it up. President Trump should be allowed to get away with elevating his personal political interests and subordinating America's national security interests. President Trump should be allowed to get away with corrupt abuse of power because that's not impeachable. That's the defense counsel's view. They're trying to peddle to the Senate. That's the, that's the Fifth Avenue standard of presidential accountability. I can shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and it doesn't matter. And you know, intent, when we think about intent and motive, it's always mattered, right? Mm -hmm. And Hakeem is absolutely correct. The president tried to shake down a foreign power with corrupt intent. And no matter how many smoke and mirrors his defense attorneys bring to the debate, that's clear to us. And for the, you know, it's been, it's just been an amazing week because to hear the president's lawyers suggest that this is just a policy disagreement is quite frankly an insult to us as members of the House and really an insult, I think, to the intelligence of the American people. We have in the House of Representatives policy debates every day. They are lively and they are spirited. I've never seen them as anything really, but each of us bringing our values and beliefs and what we know is best for the people that we represent to the table. And we all have the right to fight for those things and debate those things. But to suggest that somehow U.S. foreign policy is the president using the power of his office to coerce a foreign power into helping him cheat in the election because that's what he tried to do, was to cheat in the election. Is somehow foreign policy? That's nonsense and that's ridiculous. And so when you're looking at the senators, when you're sitting there, when you're making these arguments, are they registering on people's faces? Can you tell if any of this is having an impact? The senators, they took an oath just like we did, but they had to go one step forward and they had to take an oath to do impartial justice. Now I expect them to abide by that oath. And so when people ask me, do you really think they're going to, are they listening, are they? What I do know is that they're in their seats. Many of them are taking notes. We've had some long days and they have endured just like we have endured. Um, I hope they're listening. I hope they're remembering what brought them here in the first place. I hope they're remembering the people that they represent in their states around this nation and that this is not just about, I know President Trump tries to make everything about him, but this is, this is so much bigger than him. This is about what kind of future we want to have for our children and grandchildren. It's about what kind of future the senators want to have for their children and their grandchildren. So I'm not giving up on them. It's not over until it's over. You think we're gonna get witnesses? Well, I certainly believe that that would be the right thing to do. The American people overwhelmingly are of the view that this should be a fair trial. They are overwhelmingly of the view that a fair trial includes witnesses, includes documents, it includes evidence. There have been 15 different impeachment trials in the history of the Senate. Every single one of them has involved witnesses. In fact, the average number of witnesses at a Senate impeachment trial is 33. 
And so we're at this moment of presidential accountability. The president is charged with high crimes and misdemeanors, corruptly abusing his power, trying to cheat. And we're going to change that precedent for Donald Trump? Zero witnesses why at this moment? You, why wouldn't you want witnesses and supporting documentation? In every courtroom across America, we see witnesses and supporting evidence. I had the pleasure of building some of the best cases. You know why? Because of the witnesses and the testimony. So if you're interested in hearing the complete truth, the whole truth, and really making the right decision that could impact our country positively or negatively for centuries to come, why wouldn't you want witnesses? So you two are preparing for this over the last few weeks. And at some point, it's got to occur to you that perhaps the fix is in, right? Perhaps the senators on the Republican side are just unwilling to make a decision regardless of the facts that they see. How do you prepare for that when you're getting ready for this? How does that factor into how you guys are thinking about putting this case together? By staying very focused and controlling the things we can control. We can control our commitment to defending our democracy. We can control being thoroughly prepared to present the best case. Because we can't, there, nothing else is an option for us. We've got to present the best case and clearly communicate it to the senators and the American people why this matters. We control the things we can control and at the end of the day, it's up to the senators in their quiet place to remember the oath that they've taken, weigh the evidence, listen to witnesses, call witnesses, and look at supporting documentation and make the right decision. Once we have done that, I can sleep at night. I'm not getting any sleep right now. <laughs> but once we've done that, I can sleep at night. Yeah, there really are two audiences that uh, we are presenting information to. We're presenting uh, to the distinguished body, the most deliberative body in the world, the United States Senate. But simultaneously, we're also presenting to the American people. And I think our view has been that in both cases, we just simply need to follow the facts, apply the law, be guided by the Constitution, and present the truth, and let the chips fall where they may. That's our responsibility. Our hope is that, as Val has indicated, uh, the Senate will take seriously the oath of impartiality that it took at the very beginning of this trial. You know, every day I remember this, back to your question, the serenity chair, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. We're very focused. Thanks for watching Hill TV on YouTube. Be sure to click subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we post new videos and head to thehill.com for all the latest political news.